Good evening, and welcome to Monday News 5 Special Edition. I'm Phil Wilson. I'm Twyla Young, and here's our story lineup for this evening. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm oh, pretty good. The young man has a broken leg. He's the victim of a motorcycle accident. But the man treating him is not a doctor. Summer travel, it could be tough this year, but for many, come gasoline shortage, crowds, or high prices, the next few months are going to hold some kind of vacation. A few years ago, travel was for pleasure, and it was something out of the ordinary that people would do. You know, like once a year, they would plan this big vacation. But now, I see travel as a way of life. Congress is faced with the decision of whether or not to cut Amtrak service by 43%. If it does, Amtrak officials say they would sooner see the whole system scrapped. Not really fighting it. Um, we would prefer to see the system go under, though, than to have it chopped up so that people can't get to where they're going. It's rather pointless to run a train somewhere and leave them off there unable to get any further. Unless it's a network system, it's just not going to make it. In Iowa, two Calhoun County health clinics have found a way to help cope with the shortage of country doctors. So far, the plan's working. The doctors are happy, and so are the patients. Many rural areas of Iowa are virtually isolated from medical care. It's no secret there's a shortage of family doctors. An accident on a farm can be a serious emergency, and with no medical help close at hand, the emergency can mean a long race to the hospital. Sometimes it's too long. She also took a turn for the worse. It's hypotensive, and... Uh, she probably is going to die today. She uh, um, has a PCO2 of 120 and a pH of 6.9, and her family knows. This is a meeting of staff physicians at Stewart Memorial Community Hospital in Lake City. All of the men in this room are doctors, all except two. Leslie Newhouse and David McLean are physician's assistants Although they don't replace doctors, they know and perform many of the same skills. Morning. Morning. How are you doing? I'm oh, pretty good. The patient, a motorcycle accident victim, had a leg broken in three places. The man who treated him and gave him medication is Leslie Newhouse. They've gotten rid of the antibiotics, but I see that you're running a little, you know, temperature this morning. So I think what we'll probably have to do is you're probably going to have to go on some oral antibiotics for a little while. Newhouse and his colleague, okay, McLean, work at over. rural medical okay. clinics in Calhoun County. A physician's assistant isn't allowed to perform major surgery or write prescriptions, but he may do minor surgery, along with a variety of other medical treatments, some simple, some complex. This morning, both physician's assistants are checking on some of their hospitalized patients. Anything I can get for you? Not right now. Okay, it looks like you've got most everything you need. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, we'll see you a little later. Okay. Dr. Keenan will be around a little while. Okay. All righty? All right. There are only 10 doctors in all of Calhoun County. The physician's assistants help ease the shortage and gives the doctors more time to work on difficult cases. Basically, what we need to do is keep him fairly inactive. He's at risk of re-bleeding from his adenoids, especially for about the next week. Newhouse has been a physician's assistant for three and a half years. He sees about 30 patients a day. In this case, a small boy who's had his adenoids removed. He'll, he'll pretty much see you in a week at the clinic for a recheck, okay? Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Although the training of a physician's assistant doesn't require the extensive schooling of a doctor, it is, by any standard, rigorous. Well, you're going to have to have a, at least a bachelor's degree and some experience in a health-related uh, field uh, before they will allow you into the PA program. And the PA program is 24 months long, and it's a very hectic program. I mean, you go all day long, every day, uh, with two weeks off at Christmas, and that's about it. David McLean practices at the Rockwell City yeah, Clinic. He received his license last June. This morning, he too is visiting hospital patients. I had a friend who uh, uh, was in medical school, and he had talked to me several times about the physician assistant program. And uh, it all sounded very good, so we applied and got in and, and went with it. So far, about 180 physician's assistants have been registered in Iowa since the program began in 1972. 
The doctors say it's been successful. Basically, the uh, physician assistant uh, personnel that I have worked with, uh, I feel have been knowledgeable and conscientious people. They conduct themselves uh, as professionals, and uh, we've been very happy with their help. What effect has this program had on medical care in the county? Well, I feel that uh, we've been able to provide uh, service to more people uh, and provide it uh, at a more convenient time for a lot of the patients and uh, made it uh, easier for the patients to get to us. One of Newhouse's patients is 67-year-old Leonard Kessel. A recent heart attack brought him to the brink of death. He's going all right. He's doing real well. You got any idea when you want to see him? Well, he's getting pretty close. He's, what, 18 or 19 days now. So sometime in the next couple of days, if it's all right with you. I That's think. fine. We had some problems for a while, though, didn't we, Leonard? Yes, but this, this place is the most fabulous hospital in the Midwest. They've got the best medical technicians here and the best doctors by far. And, and I know the nurses have a lot to do with it and their age, too, otherwise. I know I wouldn't be sitting here today without doctors. After the morning visit to the hospital, both physicians' assistants go to their clinics where more patients are waiting. At the Lake City Clinic, we asked Newhouse what he would do if a patient had symptoms that he couldn't diagnose. If there's a problem case that we run into, I'm the first one that uh, looks for help or asks for uh, a consultation, this sort of thing. I admit people to the hospital, work them up, diagnose them, and uh, treat them or also uh, with um, Dr. Comstock, who's my employing physician, uh, looking over my shoulder and making sure that things are going along all right. Well, they have the same uh, degree of uh, confidence as physicians in the areas in which they practice. Uh, a comparison would be uh, you wouldn't want your family practitioner to remove a brain tumor. Uh, neither would you want uh, a physician's assistant doing major surgery unassisted. But in the areas that they do practice their endeavor, why they're as competent in what they do as anybody else would be that does these things. Have you ever had a situation in which a patient has shown some reluctance about seeing you because uh, you're not a doctor? Very, very seldom. Um, I've only had one person ever refuse to see me, and this was here at the clinic. I ultimately saw that person in the emergency room uh, at the hospital, and this was about two and a half years ago, and ever since then it's a regular patient. We take care of him on a routine basis. Well, Les, have you ever thought of uh, becoming a doctor? I would like to. Uh, it's crossed my mind a lot, but not so much for, for what would probably be the obvious reasons. Um, I would really... What would if, be the obvious reasons? The obvious reasons I'm sure that most people think about would be uh, an increase in salary, uh, prestige, that sort of thing. But the big thing that, that I find that bothers me the most is uh, I'm able to pick up a lot of things, but I can't do anything about them. I would like to be able to do more. Has the thought crossed your mind that maybe uh, I might want to be a doctor someday? Oh, I don't think so. I really enjoy what I'm doing. Um, I enjoy meeting these people. Um, I guess I'm really not anxious to go back and, and go the extra so many years uh, through the rigors again. And I really enjoy what I'm doing out here. Les, what would you say is the most satisfying part of your job? The look on people's face when they come back and they're better. That's, that says it all right there. It's really a nice feeling to know you've done something right and someone actually appreciates it. By the way, Twyla, the pay for a physician's assistant doesn't approach that of a doctor, but it's not bad, 15 to 20,000 a year. It's not bad. Coming up next, we'll take a look at what's ahead for summer travelers and what things you might want to take into consideration when you're planning a summer trip.
The travel season is upon us and many people have made or are making plans for summer vacations. Well, the next few months will be filled with much more than camping trips and Disneyland adventures. There's the gasoline situation to deal with. There's the United Airlines strike that could ground would-be super savers. And inflation is driving up the cost of hotels and restaurant meals. So we thought we would look into the situation. For many people, the decision about a summer vacation will be made right here at the gas pump. Decisions about which direction to go, how far to go, maybe not to go at all. But for many others, the gasoline situation simply will not interfere with the determination to take that cross-country trip in the family car. Do you often uh, travel long distances by car in the summer? Yeah. Plan to continue? Well, we make one trip a year, though. <coughs> we're going to go over and see our son. And then we're going to turn around and come back. We talked with travelers at rest stops and service stations along Interstate 80, and the gasoline situation was very much on their minds. It had changed some plans, it had cost them some extra money, but so far they had found what they needed. We're going to Illinois. We're going to Rockford. And have you had any trouble finding gasoline? Mm -mm, mm -mm. No, and it's higher up here. It's about 10 cents higher. Uh, in Kansas City, mm -hmm. uh, a weekend there wasn't any gasoline. Um, all the filling stations were closed. There were some empty tanks. But coming back, there was no problem. I had heard there was trouble in Indiana that they were putting 10 mile or 10 gallon limits on it. But since this only takes 10 gallons anyway, I didn't have any problem. Well, we're planning on going out to Oregon this summer, and we're going to fly instead of drive because it's cheaper. We're going to go to California this summer, and we're going to fly instead of drive. Drivers may be avoiding the West Coast but the Iowa chapter of the American Automobile Association reports that overall trip planning requests are not down. We haven't really heard of any other than this deal out in California where there's been much of a problem. Right now, the way things look, I would say go. I mean, it's going to cost you. I mean, the gas is going up, hotels and motel rooms and meals and everything. It'll cost a little bit more money, but... A lot of people are saying if we don't do it now, it might be even worse next year. And uh, I would say go ahead and plan it. And there is more than one way to take to the highway. I'm not sitting in my living room. I'm in a recreational vehicle. Enthusiasts claim that RV travel combines the convenience and comfort of a motel with the freedom of camping. Some dealers are reporting a drop in RV sales. They blame it on the gas situation and the late spring. But these homes on wheels continue to be very popular. Uh, vans are selling, uh, mini homes are selling. Uh, we're moving some motor homes, we're moving some used trailers, we're moving some news trailers. And uh, uh, that's the odd part of it is because uh, a little bit of everything is moving probably a little bit more so this year than uh, in the past. Uh, the biggest problem with recreational vehicles is their low gas mileage. Depending upon the size and the equipment, these movable kitchen, bathroom, bedroom combinations are supposed to get from 5 to 10 miles per gallon. But like any vehicle, their actual mileage depends a lot on how they are cared for and how they are driven. If you do plan to drive this summer, there are several things the experts say you ought to do. First, travel early in the month. Most service stations get monthly allocations and they may run a little thin by the end of the month. Travel early in the day. Many gas stations are closing earlier than usual. Fill up when you drop to a quarter of a tank full. You could have trouble finding gas exactly when you need it. Besides, many stations may be requiring minimum fill-ups. Drive the speed limit. You can save 20% of your gasoline by driving 55 instead of 70. And make sure your vehicle is well-tuned with clean spark plugs and properly inflated tires and carry as light a load as you can. All of those things will help you to get better mileage. Of course, you'll get your best gasoline mileage if you leave the car at home. Especially the families with the special rates can now afford to go farther than they could before because it's faster. Uh, say they wanted to go to California. Well, to drive to California, especially with kids, would take at least three days. Whereas if you can just climb on a plane in Des Moines, you're there in a matter of two or three hours. Central Iowa's major air carrier is United Airlines, but United is on strike, and it could remain on strike through much of the summer. 
As far as vacation plans, I think it has definitely uh, had a, a decreasing effect on the amount of travel because you can't get the special fares. With the Super Saver Fare, which is by far the, the best, the cheapest way of travel, it's like a savings of 30 to 40 percent on a round trip, you have to stay on the same airline. And with United being the major carrier out of Des Moines, it's really hard you know, besides American, and they mostly just go east. They don't go west too much. It's hard to get those special fares, and if you can't get the special fares, then the families don't go. But there are other ways to travel long distances with a family. With a family of that size, I would recommend using the train, using the Amtrak system. It's uh, comfortable. It's relaxed. You can see the countryside as you go by. You're not uh, pressured. You don't have to stay in one little seat the whole time. And, it's just really comfortable, I think. Amtrak is having its problems right now. It's losing money, service is being cut back, and as usual, the trains are late. But Amtrak is also enjoying a surge of popularity among passengers. Most major routes are virtually booked for the summer. Long distance bus lines also offer special fares to vacation travelers at slightly less than comparable train packages. And Greyhound officials expect a good summer thanks to the gasoline situation. But there are those who think that the best alternative to long distance car travel is not another form of transportation, but another form of vacation. This is Amana, home of the famous Amana woolen mills, the famous Amana furniture factory, famous food, famous crafts, famous quaint villages. In fact, the Amana colonies have turned into quite a tourist attraction. And this is only one of the areas that the Iowa Development Commission is hoping will lure vacation dollars to come to or to stay in Iowa. It's becoming much easier to convince the Iowans of Iowa. We have an in-state uh, promotional campaign that's based upon the cooperation of all of the newspaper people in the state and the, the media people, whether it be radio or television, where we produce uh, the slicks for the newspapers, tapes for radio, spots for TV, that type of thing that simply say, try Iowa, and give her a, a, a sampling of the things that we would suggest. For example, a beautiful park system in our state. If you enjoy camping or picnicking, that's available right to us. Try Iowa. Over a period of time, we've the interest in our state by our own people has gone up each year. We discover that, that the forest isn't always greener on the other side of the hill, you know. We, Tourism, in its many forms, is nearly a one and a half billion dollar annual business in this state, and the Development Commission thinks that the gasoline situation could actually help that business. Lacking the glamorous and the spectacular, Iowa is, according to Rainey, a treasure trove of many vacations, what Rainey calls one tankful trips. So if the gasoline situation and inflation kill plans for that traditional venture across the country for a two-week summer trip, Maybe places like the Amanas or Iowa's Lake region can lure families halfway across the state for a few days instead. Phil, everywhere we went, one of the comments that we heard most often about the gasoline situation is that people think the shortage is a myth. They say that they are trying to drive the price up, and when they drive it up high enough, there'll be plenty of gasoline. Well, whether or not that's true, a lot of people believe it, and it's one reason that people are so willing to keep driving this summer. Mm -hmm, I've heard that. You touched on Amtrak. Uh, the fate of Amtrak, the nation's experimental rail system, is important to Wyoming, of course, especially if gasoline becomes really scarce. Well, last week, our Bob Pyle took a ride on Amtrak, and he brings us a report on how the struggling rail line is doing and what the passengers think of it. American railway system is in a crisis state. Many freight lines across the country are fighting from going bankrupt. And except for a financially weak Amtrak, passenger rail systems have all but disappeared from the land. <laughs> It wasn't always that way. The Iron Horse used to be the bloodline of America, carrying goods and people to the far reaches of a growing land. Now the stockyards are empty, steel rails have rusted. They belong to the wind and the sand. But we long will remember the steel and the timber and the pulse that once beat. But today, the iron pounding is quiet. It, for the most part, has been silenced by the roar overhead of the jet plane. 
and the whining of tires on 18-wheelers and autos. You look at the same, same trend line for the other modes of competition. While railroad share has been going down, the other modes uh, share of traffic has continually been climbing up. So there has been an impact as a result of other modes of transportation. In Iowa in the past 10 years, more than 1,200 miles of track have been abandoned, making way for highways and other government subsidized projects. The continual decline in the number of miles of track, not only in Iowa, but across the country, is indicative that there are other forces that are competing for the transportation dollar. Kansas City, Albuquerque, Flagstaff, Los Angeles, and intermediate stops. Amtrak welcomes you all aboard. When I found out that I was going to ride Amtrak to Chicago for this story, I was excited. I never traveled by rail and thought it would be an adventure. But when I found out where and when I'd have to make connections, my feelings of excitement dimmed somewhat. Osceola was the nearest stop to Des Moines, and that's about a 45-minute drive. On top of that, you have to be in Osceola at 6.30 in the morning to catch the train. So we had to leave Des Moines at 5.30. Have you ever heard the expression, hurry up and wait? That's just what we did. Wait an hour and a half along with one other person who wanted to board the train. <laughs> the Zephyr rolled into Osceola Station around 8 o'clock. And finally, we were off. The schedule called for a six-hour ride to Chicago. Plenty of time to see the train from front to back to get a feel from the people riding it just what they thought of the service. So far, it's been real nice. What do you like about the rail travel? The leisureliness of it, and also seeing the scenery, and uh, it's cheaper than flying. And it's been very rocky and bumpy and noisy, and uh, you name it. The bumpy ride is not so much caused by the cars themselves, but what's underneath them. Tracks have been let go for many, many years, have not been kept up. Uh, they're fine, they're very serviceable for freight, but they are not for passenger, and especially for meeting schedules. As the train clambered on, we turned our attention to the passengers, people from all walks of life, students, ministers, businessmen, retired people. Their reasons for being on the train were as varied as their lifestyles. Well, the last time we rode was about a year and a half ago. And uh, that time we went all over the west, western United States on a two week pass and really enjoyed it then. And so we're riding again now. It's been a real great vacation. Uh, I've enjoyed eating in the dining room. Food's quite good. And we've met very, quite a few very interesting people. I prefer uh, the trains because you can see where you're going. You can look out and see where, see the countryside. One thing we found surprising was the friendships established during the trip. What did you she teach her how to do? How to make a cup and saucer, and I said, I think I made a hundred of them. Uh -huh. If I had time, I'd probably score. Oh, look at that. This is what she taught me how to do, and I made about ten of them. That's amazing. You two just got together and you decided yes. to learn how to do that. That's, that's fantastic. In this short length of time. And now, time. now you're now you're leaving, right? <laughs> oh well. Bye now, Cole. Bye. And if you choose just to be by yourself and think and gaze out the window, you can, sort of. <laughs> you can't even see out these windows. What's wrong with them? They're filthy. How long have they been filthy? Ever since I got on the train in Denver, uh, I know the bathrooms. They haven't been clean since San Francisco. <laughs> so it's uh, some of the sanitation here has been making the uh, trip a little bit difficult for you? Really difficult. This will probably be the last train ride I take. By the time we rolled into Chicago, many of the passengers were looking forward to getting their feet on stable ground again. Long lines at gas stations have been ugly reminders that we're in the midst of an energy crunch. Scenes like this are turning people's thoughts towards energy efficient transportation. Recent ridership figures show that Amtrak rail service is benefiting by this search for cheaper transportation. People uh, definitely are turning to the trains. Our ridership is up nationwide 43%. Advanced bookings are just tremendous. Um, in the eight years Amtrak has been 
it has never seen it like this. The fact that ridership is up is encouraging for Amtrak. But Dixon admits they still have a long way to go before they convince Congress not to cut Amtrak service by 43%. We're not really fighting it. Um, we would prefer to see the system go under, though, than to have it chopped up so that people can't get to where they're going. It's rather pointless to run a train somewhere and leave them off there unable to get any further. Unless it's a network system, it's just not going to make it. Amtrak is federally subsidized. Since its beginning eight years ago, it has lost more than $373 billion. That's making lawmakers as well as local transportation officials think that this money should be pumped into other more profitable forms of transportation. We feel that as an alternative to continually pouring millions and billions into subsidies, that perhaps they ought to be looking at the existing inner city transportation system that we already have and putting some of that money, if we're going to put money in it, let's put money in a system such as our bus system that hooks and links virtually every community in the state of Iowa. The cutback proposals would eliminate about 30 trains. These trains carry 10% of Amtrak's passengers. This cut, Holland says, would have little effect on the nation's overall transportation system. But it would affect Iowa, because one of the train routes to be cut is the San Francisco Zephyr Line, which rolls through the southern part of the state. Amtrak feels that if the line is discontinued in Iowa, they will never be in a financially strong enough position to bring the train back, which would be bad news for the few people who still enjoy riding the trains. The future of Amtrak will be decided in Washington probably by the early fall. That decision will affect millions of passengers, including thousands of folks in southern Iowa. Well, I'm one of those people. I'd hate to see Iowa lose its passenger service. Well, that's Monday, News 5 Special Edition for May 21st. Join us again in two weeks. For Twyla Young, I'm Phil Wilson. Thank you and good night. Thank you.